All right, we've been looking at keys to spiritual growth on, on Sunday nights and uh, using 2 Peter 3.18 as our kind of our guiding verse. Um, that verse says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. And we saw that the, the master key to all of this, if we're going to grow in the Lord, uh, we're going to actually be turning to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, if you're looking for the, uh, the text tonight. Uh, but we saw the key to all of this. If we're going to grow in the Lord, the key is the Bible. Uh, we're just not going to grow without getting into God's Word. Uh, God compares it to, to spiritual food. And if you've ever seen someone who's malnourished, someone who doesn't get food or is not getting the, uh, the benefit from food, uh, it's, a, it's a sad, sad sight. And uh, for Christians, uh, we've got to get into God's Word if we're, if we're going to grow. We saw that the master purpose is the glory of God. You know, it's not just to make us feel better. Uh, it's not, you know, to make our life easier. Uh, we want to grow. Spiritual growth is because we love the Lord. It's, it's to glorify Him. And we can use these keys then, you know, this, uh, use the Scripture and, and this, this purpose uh, to... Last week we looked at unlocking the servant's quarters. Um, obedience. You know, servants is one of the things we are as Christians. God calls us, um, we're, we're servants of God. And uh, as we use God's word and as we seek the, the glory of God, it will open up the door to obedience. It will help us. Tonight we're looking at unlocking the power plant, uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, such an important area for, in our lives as Christians. Probably many of you know Acts 1.8. You've probably heard it or memorized it at some point. Um, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Um, you know, it would be like... Without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it would be like having a car with no petrol. You know, you'd, it'd all be there. It would look like it should work. Uh, it would look, you know, it might look fine, but without petrol, or you could even have petrol and have the, blo the, lo the line be blocked. Get those words out. And, uh, you know, without that power getting to where it needs to go, uh, it's, it's useless. And that's many uh, Christians' lives as we resist or, or do not uh, have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, let me start reading in verse 17. We'll just read a few verses here tonight. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 17, he says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We'll just stop reading there. He goes on and gives some more details, but in Ephesians chapter 5 here, he talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to understand, we cannot live the Christian life in our own strength. You know, religion is, is built on the idea of, of trying to work and, and please God, and, and you know, maybe we can earn our way to heaven. Well, God says that's just, that's just not the way it works. Uh, we cannot live the Christian life in our own strength. And unfortunately, many Christians try to function without the Holy Spirit. Uh, someone has said God could withdraw the Holy Spirit, and most Christians wouldn't even notice, unfortunately. Uh, I think we would notice, but uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person, and God's Holy Spirit, you know, we only believe in one God, and we want God's working, God working in our lives. And he starts here in Ephesians chapter 5, first with the contrast, and we need to see the contrast first. He says, not with wine, be not drunk with wine. Um, you know, there's a lot of substitutes people try to look to to give them what they need to do what they want to do. Uh, sometimes we call it, you ever heard the expression Dutch courage? Is, is, am, I, am I using that right? Um, 
You know, people take a few drinks and boy, then they're confident to do whatever it is that, that they need to do. You know, drunkenness is a worldwide problem. Uh, it's all over the world. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people are trying to change the results without changing the cause. <laughs> they they want to be able to drink and get drunk, but not have the problems of drunkenness. And they, they make foolish statements like, you know, drink wisely or, you know, and things like that. In Paul's time, even Christians used alcohol to make water pure. But the point was to put something in the water so that the water would be safe to drink. It wasn't to drink the alcohol. It wasn't to drink the wine. To use it as a drink, uh, unmixed with water, was called strong drink. And uh, God condemned that. God condemns the use of, of alcoholic wine. Proverbs 23, 31, he says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Uh, that's talking about alcoholic beverage, moving around. Uh, God says, don't do that. Uh, Christians today, I, I don't think Christians should even have alcohol in their home. And you say, oh, we cook with it. Well, let's cook with something else. Uh, you, don't, you don't need that influence of someone saying, oh, there's, there's some alcohol that I can, I can use. And, and the point is this. God doesn't want you to replace him with alcohol. God wants you to know the power of his Holy Spirit. And there's other things that you could, you could put in there, different drugs and so on. Uh, don't turn to something else for what God wants to su supply to you. Um, someone has given a, a Christian wine list. Uh, it's kind of a play on words. How, how to consider things like, like this scripturally. I'll just give it to you quickly. I've got them on notes here, and you can, you can get them afterwards. Uh, one is, will it be habit-forming? You know, there's things in life that, you know, one, one alcoholic drink in your life is probably not going to kill you. Well, it might, but anyway. Uh, but will it be habit-forming? That's the problem with many of these things. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse, verse 12, he says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. There's things that, oh, you say, oh, just one won't hurt, but then it's the second and the third. And Listen, if you never take the first drink, you'll never be an alcoholic. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. Um, will, it, will it be habit for me? Will it lead to sin? We, re we read Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. I think most people read that and they think, oh, God is saying don't drink too much wine. That's not what he's saying at all. He's not, it's not the difference between a little wine and a lot of wine. It's talking about what it leads to. Have you ever seen somebody who's been drinking? Boy, they can talk real loud, can't they? They talk to excess. They can get aggressive. They, they do it to excess. You see, drinking, drinking alcohol leads to excess, leads to debauchery. And that's what God is saying. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. It leads to debauchery. It leads to problems. Will it lead to sin? There's other things to consider. Uh, will it offend a weaker brother? We, uh, we knew a lady who had been an alcoholic and then gotten saved and didn't drink. And she went to a church and they had the Lord's Supper. And you know what they used? Alcohol. It doesn't even fit the picture. But anyway, uh, in Proverbs, I'm sorry, Romans 14, verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. We need to be careful that what, what we do doesn't cause someone else a problem. Will it harm my testimony? Romans 14, 16 says, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. We need to be careful in, in how we're representing the Lord. Will it bring glory to God? That's really the, the main question. Now, these are just some questions to ask yourself, not just with alcohol, or, uh, but with things in general, uh, that we can make decisions. Is this going to be a godly thing? God says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Um, you know, there's a, it's interesting how he compares filling with the Holy Spirit to being drunk with wine. Uh, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Because there, there are some similarities. Um, now, I tell you, one thing I, I don't appreciate in life is people using drunken behavior for comedy. I don't find it funny. Uh, as a pastor... I minister to people who have been abused because of alcohol. We minister to children all the time who are, who are in trouble because of alcohol. A lot of the problems you read about in the news, it's because of alcohol. 
people drowning, people having wrecks. You know, there, there's a lot of problems. I, I don't find it funny. But it, it's, we've all seen a drunk person. Maybe some of you have been a drunk person. And, you know, they walk differently. They talk differently. They act and think and feel differently. And it impairs their judgment. Well, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the similarity is you're going to walk differently. You're going to talk differently and act and think and feel. You know, there's shy people who will speak up because the Holy Spirit gives them the power to, to have that courage. Uh, there's things that you'll do that you never thought you'd do with the power of the Holy Spirit. But instead of impairing your judgment, the Holy Spirit improves your judgment. That's, that's the difference. And he, he makes a comparison there. And he's saying, don't try and get out of a bottle what you can get from God. You know, don't try and, and have a, a substitute. Don't have something that's a, a terrible substitute when God has said, don't be drunk with wine, where in his excess. And then he comes to the, not just the contrast, but the command, but be filled with the Spirit. God wants us to know the power of his Holy Spirit in our lives. So first we see the contrast, be not. Then we see the command, be filled. Be filled with the Spirit. Let me give you a couple of examples from Scripture here. Acts chapter 2. This is the day of Pentecost when the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's kind of a strange thing to think about. I mean, the Holy Spirit's always been here. But this is when His ministry in the New Testament uh, started. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 13. Here's what the people said. They, mocking said, these men are full of new wine. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit came, the people said, they're drunk. Uh, Verse 15, Peter said, These are not drunken, as ye suppose. And uh, verse 16, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You know, as, they, as they looked at them, they didn't know the difference. Here's these guys there preaching and you know, getting excited about the things of God. And said, Those guys are drunk. No, that's, Peter said, This is the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, God's Holy Spirit... God wants him to have free access and control in every area of our life. Now, this is a command. Uh, this is really interesting because there's a lot of things about our relationship to the Holy Spirit that God doesn't command. But this one, he commands. He says, be filled with the Spirit. He doesn't command us to be indwelt by the Spirit. You know why? Because when you get saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. That's, what, that's really what salvation is. In fact, in, in Romans 8 and verse 9, he says this. He says, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. <laughs> He's saying, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not a Christian. Right. And in fact, then in 1 Corinthians, he puts it in, in a way, it's like, don't you understand? What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? And it's like... Didn't you know that? <laughs> uh, the Holy Spirit is indwelling you. So God doesn't command that. He just says when you get saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence. Uh, he doesn't command us to be baptized in the Spirit. Listen, the, the Holy Spirit does that at salvation. Uh, he doesn't command us to be uh, sealed by the Spirit. Now, that's a, a, another area. You know, God's um, promise, God's um, down payment, you might say, is His Holy Spirit, that we have eternal life in heaven. Uh, we already are sealed by the Spirit. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to look for a second blessing. You know, you're, you have all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. Uh, he, he doesn't come in sections. Uh, we're commanded to be continually letting the Holy Spirit fill us. None of those others are commanded, but he says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, I've got some uh, physical illustrations here I wanted to use. This is going to be interesting to me, if it, see if it works. Um, let's see here. Now, in here, I've got some sugar. It's not all diet sugar, but some of it is. Let's say this represents you. Clear life. And this is God's Holy Spirit. Now, I should have brought a spoon there, but uh, you can imagine that uh, melting. Uh, it, it permeates every part of you. That, that's what the filling of the Holy Spirit is like. There's no part of you that's not influenced. Uh, you would be sweet <laughs> because of that. But if there's things in your life, I'll splash too much here, uh, 
you know, you've got a, a problem with this or an area that you're withholding from the Lord and that. And, um, you know, this is something that you decided, well, God doesn't need to have that. These areas, the rocks, are areas in your life where you're saying, no, you've hardened yourself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so then you're not filled. There's areas where uh, God is not in control. You've said, no, that, that's, I'll, I'll take care of that, Lord. Th- there's another way we could illustrate this. Uh, I've often heard an illustration used uh, comparing our lives to a house or a home. And, uh, you know, the filling of the Holy Spirit is like the Lord having complete access to our home, to our life. There's no room, there's no cupboard, there's no book, there's no nook or cranny that he doesn't have access and control of. Um, If this building were your house that represents your life, there's no room where it says, Lord, others can go in there, but not you. I remember seeing a sign like that once, others only. (laughs) I always always thought it was interesting. But can you imagine telling the Lord, well, Lord, I'll let you know, this person have access to this part of my life and not you. I'm going to, he and I will work this out. Or there might be areas like, let's say your music. And you say to the Lord, well, Lord, you can have access to most of my life, but keep out of the music room. I, I grew up with that kind of music and I, I, I want that music. I don't care what, what you think. You just put your earplugs on. Now, that sounds awful, doesn't it, when you, when you say it like that? That's what we're talking about. To be filled with the Spirit, He has to have access and control of every area of our life. And and the Holy Spirit is very gentle and and kind. You know, He'll come to the music room and time to turn control of the music over to me, son. And, you know, sometimes He'll go away and, and, and leave it for a while. And then He'll come back. That music needs to be turned over to me. And I, I don't know that anybody has a problem particularly with music. Uh, maybe there's another area of your life. Ready for me to come in and take control there yet? <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit is so good to us. And yet we treat him sometimes with disdain. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been ignored by someone. I, I occasionally get, get that too. Uh, it, it's not a very pleasant feeling. And particularly when it's someone that should acknowledge you. Uh, you know, God commands, be filled with the Spirit. Uh, we need to be careful. These are just illustrations. But uh, we need to, in thinking of our lives, God's Holy Spirit will, in His kind and gentle way, bring things to your attention. And that's the time to do business with Him. That's the time to say, yes, Lord, you're right. I've been withholding that part of my life. Uh, I've been... You know, you've been telling me to to go, and I've said no. You've been telling me to stop, and I've been going. Uh, Whatever the area is. And, you know, the Lord can bring those those things to your heart and to your mind. For us to know the power of God's Holy Spirit, He has to have complete access and control. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit. Every area. Now, uh, if we're going to grow, we have to be filled with, with the Spirit. And to be filled with the Spirit, the the number one essential, of course, is salvation. (laughs) We're not going to be filled with the Spirit until we're saved, until we receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, I wanted to give you some pictures to kind of help illustrate that this evening. I've worked this out very carefully, hoping I can fit these on here. Um, This is just an illustration. The circle is is your life. The, uh, The... Looks like a chair in the middle. That's the throne of your life. This is an illustration of a person without Christ. Christ is on the outside of their life. Self is on the throne. This person obviously is not going to be filled with with the Spirit. Now the the Holy Spirit uh, can, can convict of sin. And then they have the decision to respond or not to respond. Uh, It doesn't mean that God won't have anything to do with their life. We were all affected by you know, what God is doing in the world. Uh, But this is an illustration of of a person without Christ. To be filled with the Spirit, number one essential is we must be born again. We have to be saved, receive Christ as our Savior. The second is surrender. 
like we've been talking about, giving God access and control over every area of our life. In Romans 12, 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know, it's reasonable for us to do this to the Lord. He's God. He knows. <laughs> uh, we belong to Him when we, we trust Him as Savior, giving God access and control over every area of our life. Uh, let me put up the, the next picture. This, this, this circle represents a saved person who is spirit-filled. Uh, Christ is not only in their life, Christ is on the throne of their life. We still have a self, but uh, this person is, has yielded themselves to the Lord. You see, it, we start with salvation. It continues with surrender. And each area of obedience, we need to surrender to Him. Many of them we have to surrender over and over and over again. Uh, our willful self, our self-will will, will spring up probably every day. And we have to say, Lord, that's yours. The, the third area is Scripture. Look, if you're in Ephesians there, a couple of pages to your right is Colossians chapter 3. The interesting thing about this reference, Colossians 3, verses 16 and 17, is it's very similar to what we just read in Ephesians. The difference is, in Ephesians, he says, be filled with the Spirit. In Colossians, he says, Colossians 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That, that's the main difference. The one, he says, be filled with the Spirit. The other, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. But it, it's basically a parallel passage, same results and so on. Let me read it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And then he begins to talk about submission and so on. Scripture. Uh, you know, for us to be uh, spirit-filled, we're going to have to be submitted to God's Word. And he, he talks here uh, about the same things he talks about in Ephesians with the filling of the Spirit, letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. Colossians 3, verses 16 and 17. This is, this is how God wants us to be. Not only saved, but Christ on the throne of our life. The fourth area, uh, we've seen salvation, surrender, scripture. The fourth area that's essential in this is sin dealt with. Listen, getting saved does not mean you'll never be tempted again. Getting saved does not mean you'll never sin again. But thank God, Jesus died for all of our sins. I don't know how old you are, but I wasn't born when Jesus died on the cross. You might think I'm old, but I'm not that old. And uh, you know, all of our sins were in the future. And Christ died for all of our sins. And when you trust Christ as your Savior, all of your sins are under the blood. But that doesn't mean we're not going to have to deal with our, our selfish nature and, and so on. And we're going to have to deal with sin as Christians. We're going to have to submit to God. To be spirit-filled, we're going to have to let the, the Spirit have control of all those areas where we'd like to sin. Listen, there's some things in life that don't tempt me a bit. There's other things that are very tempting because that's what I want to do. That's what my sinful nature wants to do. And they're different for, uh, amongst us. It's easy for me to condemn your sins because they don't bother me. <laughs> but the ones that are a problem are my own. And we need to deal with, with sin. Unfortunately, many Christians are self-centered rather than spirit-filled. Let me give you my, my final example here. This is a picture of a Christian's life, but self is on the throne instead of the Lord. Now, I hope you can see those. I'm sorry they're not, not higher up. But, uh, you know, many times as Christians, we put self on the throne rather than the Lord. Uh, we, we take areas uh, and we say, I'll... Don't worry about that, Lord. I'll, I'll take care of that. Instead of saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? God wants us to know his power. God wants us to know his peace. And, and all the things, the, the fruit of the Spirit. But you know, uh, many times, as if we're being selfish, we're not fully trusting the Lord. I was hearing somebody sing the other day, and, and he, in talking about it, he said, you know, 
Isn't it amazing how we'll trust God for eternity, but we won't trust Him for things in life? <laughs> you know, it, many times, because we're not Spirit-filled, we're not trusting Him. Uh, sometimes we're disobeying Him, or, or we're, we're not praying, or we're not witnessing. Uh, we're not having the interest in God's Word that we should. Uh, we're having sinful thoughts, or feeling guilty, or worried, or discouraged, or depressed. Listen, what, what kind of a testimony is it when as Christians uh, we're, we're under the world's power and, and the world is having victory rather than us having victory in Jesus? Uh, we, need, we need what God offers in Jesus being on the throne of our life. And, uh, you know, God is, is so gracious. He'll, he'll deal with us kindly and, and, and carefully, but we need to be filled with the Spirit. Now, these four essentials that we've talked about, you just can't get away from them. If there's got to be salvation, I and mean, that goes without saying, really. But there's got to be surrender and scripture and sin being dealt with. And God will help us to do that. One of the men that I, I like to read, uh, he says, if you'll admit that it's a sin problem, he said, that's good. God can deal with our sin. <laughs> the problem many times is we just won't even admit it's a sin problem. God is easy, easily able to deal with our sin if we'll just confess it and forsake it. See, being filled with the Spirit is not some ecstasy that overcomes us or slays us. It's not magic. Being filled with the Spirit is basically living every moment as if we're standing in the presence of Jesus Christ. You know, thinking about that as a definition this week has helped me. <laughs> being filled with the Spirit is, is living every moment as if we're standing in the presence of Jesus Christ. I, I thought about doing an illustration, having Ash or somebody hang on to my belt and just walking around and ignoring him. Uh, you know, that, that's the way we treat the Holy Spirit many times. That's how we treat the Lord Jesus. He is with us. You know, sometimes we pray, Lord, be with us. And he's standing right next to us. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, you know, the Lord is with us. We just need to acknowledge that and, and give him access and control of every area of our life. Listen, being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time event. Be careful there. It's a constant relationship. It's kind of like breathing. You don't want to go whole, a whole long time without breathing. Uh, let the Holy Spirit have control. A and in a sense, it's very much like breathing. We exhale. We confess our sin. We thank God for forgiveness and turn away from sin. And we inhale by asking Jesus to take, take the throne of our life. Uh, we see the contrast. God says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't, don't look for a substitute. Do be filled with the Spirit. But then let me, let me warn you, there'll be consequences of being filled with the Spirit. Did you notice there in Ephesians chapter 5? Now, I'm being a bit facetious here. These are good consequences. Ephesians 5, 19, you'll have a song in your heart. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let me just say, according to Scripture, if you don't have a song in your heart, you're not spirit-filled. <coughs> and you can. You can. Now, I, I know, I mean, I'm not always whistling and, and singing. But sometimes I am. And, you know, the Lord can help us with that. If we'll uh, submit to Him, He can help us with our emotions. He can help us with our situations. Listen, if heaven really is our home, all this other stuff isn't going to make a whole lot of difference in eternity. I mean, some of the worst things can happen. And, and as Christians, really, we can just laugh and say, well, aren't we going to talk about this in heaven? <laughs> well, maybe not. I don't know. But there's a consequence. You'll sing. Verse 20, you'll be thankful. You know, if, if you don't have a thankful heart, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, stop and think about, well, what's, what's your relationship with the Lord? Are you saved, surrendered? Submissive, and reading the scriptures and so on, and dealing with sin. Now, you'll be thankful. Listen, God is always good. Uh, that's not the problem. When we do live in a sin-cursed world, and I mean, there's, there's plenty of problems, enough to go around. But as Christians, we can be thankful. And there's always something we can thank the Lord for. You'll sing, you'll be thankful. Now, here's another one. Boy, here's a terrible consequence. Verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of, fear of God. You'll have a submissive attitude. You won't be a rebel. And, and much more. The fruit of the Spirit. I mean, you can go 
a, a long time talking about that, can't you? The fruit of the Spirit. Oh, they're terrible, aren't they? Love, joy, peace. Boy, people are running from those, aren't they? <laughs> long suffering, gentleness. That's the one I, I, I struggle with. But goodness, faith, you know, all, all those things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life. If we'll give Him access and control to every area of our life. Now, which kind of person are you? Now, th these are just illustrations. Uh, maybe there's those here tonight who Jesus is on the outside of your life. You've never been born again. Maybe you're a Christian, but you're still on the throne. I think for most of us, we're kind of jumping between these two uh, a fair bit, you know. Okay, Lord, you take the throne. Oh, no, give it back. <laughs> uh, we laugh, and it's not funny, but... Uh, what kind of person are you? God's Holy Spirit uses God's Holy Word to make holy people. God's Word, God's Holy Spirit is so important. If we're going to grow spiritually, we need to unlock the, the, the power plant. We need to let the Holy Spirit work in us and use His Word to make us the kind of people that we, we ought to be. Um, remember, uh, being filled with the Spirit is basically just living every moment as if we're standing in the presence of Jesus Christ. What a blessing. The, the person who knows you the very best, that knows your, you inside and out, everything you've ever done wrong, every thought you've ever had, loves you the most. Most of us, if we knew everything about each other, we'd, well, we'd be pretty suspicious. But God knows us, and He still loves us. And He's made a way for us to be in that process of being like Jesus. I'm looking forward to when it, it comes to fruition. Uh, what a blessing that will be. Uh, our greatest struggle is with ourselves. We can blame the devil for all kinds of things, and, and he is our enemy. But uh, our, worst, our hardest struggle is just submitting to the Lord, being filled with the Spirit. I thought we'd end, I don't think we've sung this song tonight, with uh, number 155, Have Thine Own Way. Just sing a, a few verses of that. I, I do have these notes uh, for you to take home tonight. I hope that you will. It's, it's nothing uh, very um, unusual. It's just a, a basic message tonight. Page 155.